You're listening to Big Table, a podcast about books and conversation presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles. I'm your host, JC Gable. For each episode, we speak to one author about a singular book in a long form interview. Each interview is then followed by a brief reading, sometimes from the same book being discussed, sometimes by a like minded title and a different author. But every episode does retain a loose theme throughout and is inspired by the work of radio host and oral historian Studs Terkel. Thanks for listening. Jeff Dyer, as a writer, always defies genre. In fact, many would argue he's created his own genre with titles like But Beautiful, a book about jazz, Out of Sheer Rage, a book about trying to write a book about D.H. Lawrence, The Missing of the Soma, a meditation on World War I, and more recently, Zona, a book about a film about a journey to a room, a full length about Andre Tarkovsky's art film, Stalker. A film, Dyer says, that tests the real will of the audience. His latest book is Broadsword Calling Danny Boy, Watching Where Eagles Dare, out now in paperback from Vintage Books. Broadsword is almost a pop culture sequel to Zona, an examination of the beloved behind the scenes World War II action film starring Richard Burton and a young Clint Eastwood in one of his first starring roles. Dyer and I spoke at length last year about Where Eagles Dare, just as the hardcover was hitting shelves. Here's Jeff Dyer. So I very much enjoyed your your book about Tarkovsky's film. And I read this morning in your, I guess you'd say, after note or afterword or epilogue or postscript, I'm not sure what the right term is, that you really had never thought of doing another book about one singular film. Uh, and then you know, here we go with uh, Where Eagles Dare. And huh. I'm wondering, is you know, was the 50th anniversary hook of the film uh, too irresistible to not take the plunge? Oh, no, what it was, um, I'd started doing this little, you know, this uh, summary of, uh, of Where Eagles Dare. I always refer to these books as summaries, as a way of uh, just rendering them totally unappealing to anybody. And uh, I'd written a bit of it, and then, of course, it's... Uh, You know, it's not really the most attractive proposition, a book like this from a publisher's point of view. So when I was quite well advanced with uh, the book, which I was writing as I do most books, just for my own enjoyment, uh, as a way of seeing if there was anything that could render it slightly, to to render the unviable slightly more viable, I had a look and saw, oh yeah, there is this kind of hook, it's the 50th anniversary. And um, uh, yeah, so that uh, that was a hook to hang uh, to hang on something which would have been written anyway. I guess the question is whether it would have been publishable without that. Uh, and, uh, well, we can't get into the realm of the, of the counterfactual now. But, I mean, the real, I mean, the connection between the two for me is that, of course, Stalker by Tarkovsky is the ultimate serious art film. It's a real test of the viewer's. Uh, ability to survive in the in the thin air of such high seriousness, and I liked the the idea of following this up with this kind of uh, action Second World War action film that I saw that I saw as a kid. I thought there was uh, yeah there's something rather appropriate about that as opposed to following it up with a book on I don't know the Passenger or something like that. So you touched on something I was going to ask you later, but it's a good segue. So you <laughs> you saw this as a kid. Um, and I haven't seen it recently, but I, it seems like a like a pretty advanced film for a ten year old. Was this just at a time where it was much easier to get into films? There wasn't, I suppose, the PG thirteen rating or any of that sort of stuff, so you were able to go see this. Or did you see this with your parents? I think I probably did see it with my parents, uh, and if I did, it's one of the very few films that I went to with them. I think we only went to the cinema a total of ten times. Um, so, um, and you're right. I mean, that's the, the remarkable thing about it. It is a, a, an advanced piece of filmmaking, but in terms of the content, I mean, there's lots, <clears throat> there's an amazing amount of killing. All sorts of people on the internet have calculated the number of Germans that Clint Eastwood killed. Up in the mountains, uh, 
shooting from cable cars and hanging cables and sliding off the roofs and shooting Germans. You thought I shot a lot of people with a six shooter. You should see how we can do with a machine gun in a film like this. But most of the most of the killing is just in that kind of uh, action film mode. I it's not terribly realistic. So actually, the most violent moment in the film is when they're on the cable car and uh, Richard Burton kicks somebody in the teeth. That seems actually much more violent in a kind of realistic way than all of the all of the shooting. And I'm pretty sure I can't remember uh, the producers would have made sure that it um, uh, it fell below, you know, that the kids of a very young age could see it because they must have been aware that we, uh, 10-year-olds like me, would have constituted a, a major part of its potential, of its potential demographic. But it's an advanced piece of filmmaking, I think, in this way. Um, you know, when I go, you know, uh, other films that I saw when I loved when I was 10, such as The Italian Job, I really loved that, and I can watch a bit of it if I come in drunk and it's on TV, but I'm always watching it in that way where I'm really just watching it out of nostalgia. There's nothing to continue to engage my unelegiac adult brain, whereas in its, in, its, in its way, I think it's a very sleek piece of directing because once I start watching it now, I think it's got such a sort of rhythmic power that it's very difficult to stop watching. And I find it's not a film I'm having to make allowances for as a, in the way that I am if I was to watch, well, uh, The Italian Job or Zulu or something like that. It's one of those films that has had this second life. You could even call it a cult film that, you know, was discovered by a lot of people on television. You make a good point in the book that this film and the title in particular... Um, you know, the broadsword calling Danny Boy is, is so a part of the pop culture vernacular that, you know, on page 22 you mentioned um, that uh, this, this was used as a coded message during the cover-up of the phone hacking scandal uh, at Rupert Murdoch's, uh, you know, company in, in London. Broadsword calling Danny Boy. Yeah, but that, that's something to, really important to stress, I think, this difference between uh, Britain and America. It's absolutely imprinted in the consciousness of uh, everybody, really, in Britain over the age of 40. I mean, and over the age of 50, it's a bit like uh, those Monty Python sketches. Everybody kind of knows it. And the film doesn't have anything like the same uh, registration in the state. So I think it's really only got this, um, yeah, this. it's only deeply entrenched in the in the in the pop culture of of, of Britain it, it didn't make it across the atlantic in the same way uh in uh, in spite of the fact that of course um it's one of uh, the young Clint Eastwood's earliest starring role do me a favor will you next time you have one of these things keep it an all british operation there's several things going on in that um you know the tip of the British war films that I saw in the you know when I was uh, in it when it, most of the time when I was between seven and ten they were these quite stoical British uh, films with some reasonably close you know adherence to facts I'm thinking of th things like the Dam Busters or um, the Cruel Sea this kind of thing and in a way where Eagle Stare is obviously a big Hollywood kind of extravaganza, which with its slightly preposterous plot, this kind of stuff. Um, so it's much more of a, of a big blockbuster uh, in, in the style of things like, I don't know, The Dirty Dozen or something like that. Um, so to that extent, it's much more of an American style film. But I think it's, um, yeah, it's, Interestingly, as well, of course, it's got these, um, you know, uh, as well as Eastwood, it's got these um, British theatrical actors. And I think one of the joys early on is the way that they're, um, they're, they're uttering their lines. What now, Major? We tried for treason. A public trial would be embarrassing, painful, not only for myself also for British intelligence and Admiral Rolland. Perhaps, but not as painful as that long drop to the end of the rope. Not just the title that comes from uh, Shakespeare, it's the, it's the way that these theatrical actors deliver their lines. And of course, the thing about Richard Burton, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood is doing most of the action and Burton is doing a lot of the acting. The apt casting to cast 
Clint Eastwood and myself because we're such enormous contrasts in type. He's tall and slow and drawl. He's sort of a la Gary Cooper and as good as Gary Cooper, perhaps even better. And I'm short and thick and fast talking. Famously, he was this amazing, you know, this amazing voice. So the truth is we could hear him just uh, recite, you know, saying anything and it would sound quite mesmerizing. Now, I, my sense with you is that you must be a research junkie and that you read prodigiously. And in, in the course of writing this book, you mentioned earlier that you were kind of almost just writing it for yourself at first. Um, you know, did you go? Did you take a pretty deep dive into sort of war books at the, of the time uh, and also other war films, not just of the late 60s, but, you know, basically of the post-war period? Yeah, well, several things about this. Like... Um like our mutual friend Jonathan Leatham, uh, God, maybe I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't sort of lasso him into this too much. But I would say that Jonathan and I never do, never do any research, um, uh, and I say that for this reason: doing research always feels like something you do as a, a job of work or in a sort of academic way. Whereas Jonathan and I, one of the things that we, one of the reasons I regard him as such a sort of uh, soulmate is that we have these great passions and we love finding out about them. We have these kind of hobbies, if you like. And so when you've got these passions, it never feels like you're, just, you're doing research. So, for example, you know, um, Jonathan has never done any research at all about Bob Dylan. Now, he knows more about Bob Dylan than anyone I know, uh, but he just, knows, he just likes finding out about Bob Dylan. So that's my slight query with the idea of research and in term in this particular instance i didn't really need to do much research in the way that i did with the book on tarkovsky whereby i had to you know consciously read stuff about the film which i did again not not in the interest of research but because i wanted to find out in the case of this film and particular that particularly the background of the second world war i really didn't need to do any research at all because as someone born in 1958, uh, growing up in the 1960s, my whole childhood in Britain was so completely saturated by um, the cultural reconstruction of the Second World War. So not the actual World War with all the horrors and grimness and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, but this, but a very uh, kind of fun version of the Second World War, uh, a fun version of the Second World War, which achieves its apotheosis with this film. So, yeah, uh, a Second World War that didn't really involve the Holocaust or, or Stalingrad or, or, or anything like that. But uh, this kind of stuff, as is the case with almost everything recollected from your childhood, you don't need to um, you don't need to uh, research it because, to quote Art Pepper at the end of uh, of his autobiography, Straight Life, you know, you don't, you, you don't, all you have to do is reach for it; it's already there. Today, it is the destination of a determined cast and crew, headed by director Brian Hutton, an ancient, inaccessible awesome setting so authentic that it was considered by many to be impossible to film here but the name of this motion picture is the motto of the men who are making it where eagles dare broadsword calling danny boy watching where eagles dare by jeff dyer is published by vintage and is out now in paperback For the reading this episode, we're going to mix things up a bit. Jeff Dyer will read from his latest book of writing about photography, Seesaw, published by Grey Wolf. Seesaw is a tour de force of visual scrutiny. Dyer once again shows us how he is the master of the essay form. I'll read a short passage um, about a photograph by Fred Herzog called Man with Bandage, and uh, you can easily find this picture on the internet if you want to look at it while listening to me um, read from uh, the bit about it. A quiet belter of a photograph from 1968, Man with Bandage might justifiably be called Herzog's signature shot in several senses. 
First, because one of the many signs on view helpfully directs first-timers to the Visitors Bureau. Second, because the titular man actually bears no small resemblance to another Herzog, filmmaker Werner, as he looks these days. Telegraph wires connect the heads of this surrogate Herzog to the old lady behind him so perfectly that they serve almost as a perspectival diagram. The two are further associated both by his white bandage and her white gloves and by the way that his manly injury, wrist, is sympathetically echoed by her implied infirmity, legs, walking stick. Someone better acquainted with Vancouver's geography and the picture's orientation would know whether the long shadows are pointing towards evening or morning. The shaving cut on the man's chin tends to suggest the hurry of AM, but if this is rush hour, where's the traffic? They stare into the distance, straining to make out which of the buses routinely promised by the sign might be approaching. The light is hazy, but the man is shading his eyes as if staring into the face of divine radiance, a reminder that buses are anticipated as eagerly as the second coming and that timetables are best regarded as prophecies of only dubious reliability. Who's to say that the bandaged hand is not the result of a botched crucifixion served up by the serial obstacles of daily life, with the blooded tissue paper on his chin covering a wound self-inflicted by safety razor, as opposed to a spear in the ribs, and the bus stop as a station of the commuter's cross? To support Big Table, go to bigtablepodcast.org slash bookshop. You can help us and independent bookstore culture at the same time. Big Table is produced and presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles and is supported by Invisible Republic, a nonprofit arts organization based in Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. You can learn more about their community-based programs and publications at invisiblerepublic.org Big Table would not exist in the audio world without the expert skill sets, friendship and dedication of sound designer and editor Matea Bain and audio engineer Jacob Ross Special thanks to Eric Gorman at Gold Diggers and Alejandro Ali Cohen at Dub Lab for early encouragement and engineering prowess Thanks again for listening